Thank you. The, the St. Lawrence alum portion of the program is over. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, a quick update on River Herring and Eels and our efforts to uh, reconnect Long Island's streams and restore these fish. Uh, as we'll talk about, those two are not always uh, uh, as easy as the other. They're difficult to, uh, uh, not so hard to reconnect rivers and streams. It turns out, as Kevin explained to us earlier, not always the secret to uh, restoring populations of these fish. But just for a quick background, no, this is diadromous fish. These are, this is a Greek word that means running through. So these are fish that split their life cycles between freshwater and saltwater. There's 32,000 plus fish in the world. Most of them live in saltwater or freshwater. Only about 100 species move between the two. So really unique fish. Um, and they, and, and they, they, in the process, they give themselves extra challenges because they have to deal with problems not just in one place, but in, in multiple places as they're moving often through um, you know, large distances. So we're lucky enough to have th uh, three of these species. The first two we group under the term uh, river herring, uh, alewives and blueback herring. Uh, these are fish, these are anadromous fish. So they spend most of their lives in salt water, but they move into fresh water to spawn. Uh, these are fish uh, in the Mill River and Rockville Center. Um, they don't die after they spawn like some um, salmon species you've seen. They, they spawn, go back out to the ocean and repeat that cycle um, throughout their life seven or eight times. And then the other species is the American eel. This, this fish is the, has the opposite life cycle. It lives uh, most of its life in fresh water but starts it in the ocean. So they hatch in the middle of the North Atlantic in a place called the Sargasso Sea. They drift on ocean currents till they transform to a swimming shape. They swim into our estuaries and then into our rivers and streams. And when they arrive here, they're translucent like this. They don't have any uh, pigment and they, they find their way into our streams, go upstream and then spend 10 or 20 years living in fresh water before reversing the trip, going back out to the ocean to spawn and die. Um, why do we care about these fish? Because uh, in the process of their life, of moving from the ocean to the estuaries, the rivers and streams and back, they're moving energy. They're providing a really important pro um, role in moving energy between these different habitats. And lots of things are eating them. So this is just a sampling of some of the big predators that are eating the adult uh, eels and the adult river herring. But think about all the other species that are eating those little baby eels and all the species eating the hundreds of thousands of eggs that all the female river herring are laying in our stream. So uh, we like to say they're helping to drive our coastal ecosystem, a really important species in that regard. Uh, the problem, as Kevin mentioned, is, is habitat loss, is that they, they're not like the salmon that you see on the Discovery Channel jumping over grizzly bears and up waterfalls. They're, they're very capable swimmers, but our dams, even our small low head dams, are, are absolute permanent barriers for them. So they can't get upstream to the fresh water that they need. And so the solution is to try, at least here, to install fish passes. Uh, this is the first fish pass, the first fish ladder on Long Island, permanently installed on the Carmen's River at Hards Lake. Um, this is a more recent picture of, a, uh, we have a solar uh, counting system installed here. And unfortunately, we've been doing this for a couple years now. The, the news doesn't seem to be great. Uh, we're not seeing numbers, not even near what were counted here by Cornell uh, in, in 2012. So um, that, that is likely related to the story Kevin told you earlier, that the threat that these fish are not facing in freshwater, but really out is to sea. Um, but it also could relate to the fact that these technical fishways are just not that effective in moving fish sometimes. And it's a worry here because uh, the town of Brookhaven and the, and the county of Suffolk have spent millions of dollars now on new fish passes upstream from this one. So if this one's not working, we have, well, we're having uh, public money uh, not being put to good use. Before the pandemic, we were up to 14 different fishways across Long Island, and there were seven new ones. I'm going to just buzz through them from west to east. Uh, the first is the Mill River where that video was taken the, in this spillway. 
Uh, remarkably, the fish that were in that video um, arrived at this spillway after going under Sunrise Highway, Merrick Road, and the Long Island Railroad, nearly 700 feet, an underground passage that most wildlife experts that looked at this site said they wouldn't do. Um, it's a sign of how resilient these fish are. They are going to go upstream if we give them a chance to. Uh, I like to say that if, you know, they're like the old baseball movie, that if we build it, they will come, they will use these passes. So this new fishway was installed as part of the governor's uh, office of storm recovery project on this river. Uh, it's just available for them for the first time this year. And we, are, uh, we have a camera here now trying to document that they're using it. We will, um, we will see. Uh, this is a small creek in Baldwin, uh, sort of a, a clever solution. This is an old 1960s era uh, uh, concrete um, channel that just had sheet flow across it. It was not deep enough for the fish to navigate. So the engineers at LKMA came up with this idea of notching it and creating a deeper passage that, that uh, channelized the, the water into a place where they could swim. And then as it goes under the culvert here, deepen so they can get up that small slope. Um, a little further east in Massapequa, this is the first uh, eel-only uh, fishway installed on the eastern spillway at Massapequa Lake. Seatuck uh, did this. We brought in some off-island expertise from Connecticut. Um, Steve Gephardt and Sally Harold came down and helped us design this. And this was instantly was being used. The eels were by the thousands climbing up through that little piece of PVC pipe into the lake. Uh, out east in Patchogue, this is the Swan River, a really nice uh, bypass channel, a nature-like channel that comes out of the main spillway and goes uh, west and curves up this nice nature-like look, uh, nature -like looking stream. Uh, this is right after it was just built, of course, but it has since greened up quite a bit, and, and this is where that passage enters the lake. Uh, Supervisor Ed Romaine there in the blue shirt, a big fan of these kind of projects. Uh, this is on the uh, Carmen's River. Uh, this is Lower Lake, sort of, again, a nature-like uh, fishway designed by GEI Engineering. Um, these these nature-like systems are designed to look like a natural stream, but they are very much engineered. And these photos, you can see that there's, there, you know, they look like a stream, but they're really a system of pools and weirs, so the fish can, can swim up a small uh, weir and then rest in a pool and then jump up another step. Um, out on the Peconic River at Forge Road, this Alaskan Steep Pass bypass channel was just finished. I think this is the, uh, the third of four barriers on the Peconic River. Uh, the fourth one already has a fishway. This is the third one. The first one has a fishway, so we're down to one more, the second dam at Upper, Mil uh, Upper Mills. Um, so that one is, uh, in, has been designed, hopefully will be online soon, at which point the entire Peconic River will, will be reconnected. And then finally, uh, a site that many of you probably know on the Little River, this is a tributary of the Peconic. Uh, this is the Woodhull Dam, um, a really nice fishway design here, which includes a, a special eel pass on the outside. And this, this place is being uh, named after one of our great river herring champions. I like to call him the godfather of diadromous fish restoration on Long Island, uh, Byron Young. Um, a dedication is, is coming soon. Uh, I, I went to find some pictures of Byron. For, I've realized I have lots and lots of pictures of Byron. I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with him in the field, you know, with video cameras and moving fish and taking pictures of birds carrying fish. Um, this is my favorite, though, is Byron with his high-tech uh, depth finder there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop there. Time is up. Thank you.